Welcome to the new season of Ask Stago, the podcast dedicated to provide expert answers to your expert questions in hemostasis. I am Lisa Gannon and I'm very glad to be joining you for another season. I'm also delighted to welcome my new co-host, Anne-Cecile Ortega, Global Product Line Manager at Stago. You are so welcome, Anne-Cecile. Hello, Lisa. Hello, everyone listening. So, Anne-Cecile, today we're diving into our first episode of Season 5. Yes. For today's subject, we are going to take an in-depth focus on the recent update to the ISO guideline 1589, which applies to medical laboratories. To understand what it really means for us as manufacturers and indeed the clinical laboratory, we are delighted to be joined by an expert in this area, Evelyn Escarmont. Evelyn, thank you so much for joining us today to break this new update down for us to more digestible pieces. You are the Quality and Compliance Operational Director for Stego, so you are clearly very well positioned to that for us here today. Hello, Anne-Cécile. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me with you on this podcast. Hello, Evelyn. It's a pleasure. As you know, we like to start our episodes with some basic definitions. So to start off, can you tell us what is the goal of the ISO 15189 guideline? The ISO 15189 standard specifies requirements for quality and competence in medical laboratories. Mm -hmm. This document is applicable to medical laboratories in developing their management systems and assessing their competence. It's also applicable for confirming confirming or recognizing the competence of the medical laboratories by laboratory users, regulatory authorities, and accreditation bodies. This new version is also applicable to point-of-care testing. Evelyn, could you take us through a high-level view of the type of changes which have been applied to this guideline with this update? With pleasure. I will summarize the type of changes in seven items. The first main change is the modification of the structure of the document with requirements divided into five chapters. This new structure is similar to ISO 19025 version uh, 2017, applicable to uh, all the laboratories, not specifically the medical ones, kind of parent standard of ISO uh, 19089. Just before, we have mentioned point-of-care testing, and the second main change is related uh, related to that. The former ISO 22870 standard dedicated to POC testing is deleted and integrated in ISO 15. 19189, sorry, as an annex for delocalized medical biology examinations. The third main change, risk management as the foundation of the standard with alignment with ISO 901 version uh, 2007, uh, sorry, 15, and the specific chapter on actions to be taken in response to risks and opportunities for improvement. Fourth, the patient is back at the center of the approach with specific requirements relating to patients. Then requirements relating to impartiality are reinforced and the analytical process takes greater account of the risk of erroneous results and measurement uncertainties. Finally, the concepts of business continuity plan and preparation for emergency situations appear. 
And what could the impacts be for the medical laboratory, Evelyn, i.e. what changes uh, do they need to address and how? From the medical laboratory side, this new version is not a revolution, but as often, there will be a lot of activities to be uh, adapt and policies, procedures, records to be updated or created. Especially, perhaps the more surprising changes to be addressed would be actions to taken in response to risks and opportunities for improvement. Uh, let mine with ISO uh, 9001 uh, version uh, 2015. And the concepts of business continuity plan and preparation for emergency situations. Surprising because they are far from the technical requirements. Evelyn, could you explain some specific example for us, please? Yes, for sure. The specific changes proposed are quite varied, but some examples of key changes which could directly impact the medical lab are with respect to IQC and EQA programs. More stringent guidelines are presented in terms of commutability, concentration levels used, the need for trend analysis and what actions to take when results fall out of the criteria. On the subject of concentration levels for internally quality control, it states that the IQC has concentration levels at or near clinical decision points and covers the relevant range of the examination method. For EQA programs, there is a specific part on commutability of um, EQA materials, and if they could hamper comparison between some methods, it can still be useful for comparisons to be made with other methods rather than relying only on within method comparison. Mm. And yes, it's very important that the EQA program being employed allows for different levels of comparison depending on peer groups or indeed a global comparison. So I understand there's also an allowance for when the EQA program is not available for, for example, for a, a pr particular parameter, that an acceptable alternative could include interlaboratory comparison of the result of the uh, examination of identical IQC materials. So in this case, a peer group review could be very helpful in these instances. Yes, you are right, Lisa. There is also a point regarding the use of third party controls. The new guideline states that their use should be considered either as an alternative to or in addition to control material supplied by the reagent or instrument manufacturer. This could be a good idea if one was not fully confident in the process undertaken by the supplier used. In the case of the Stago process, we are using separate catalog numbers, which can be used independent of the lot numbers used in the lab, allowing for this complete independent verification of the process. Another point discussed is the need for sufficient resources requirements for the laboratory in that they should have access to a sufficient number of competent persons to perform its activities. Uh, and this obviously is a huge challenge for laboratories worldwide in the context of uh, tightening healthcare budgets and consolidation of uh, resources. There is clearly an opportunity for us as a supplier to help our customers optimize their workflows using a lean approach. 
Another interesting change was on the subject of reagents and consumables acceptance testing. It now states that patients' samples are preferred during the load conversion verification to avoid IQC commutability issues. It also discusses the comparability of examinations results when different methods and or equipment equipment are used for an examination and or the examination is performed at a different site. It states that a procedure for establishing the comparability of results uh, for patient samples throughout the clinically significant intervals should be defined. Uh, so commercially available patient sample correlation sets could be really useful in these instances, knowing how difficult it can be to obtain patient samples locally, which are spanning the full measuring range of each parameter. So thank you, Evelyn, for this and for your conclusion. And thank you all for listening too. As usual, all literature sources and links to previous podcasts are listed in the podcast description box. And please do feel free to send us any questions that you may have at our email address, ask at stago.com. And we'll be so happy to address any questions in our following episodes. See you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Stago. Diagnostics is in our blood.